Good evening, everybody. I can hear you. Hey, there you go. There you go. Well, welcome to our Wednesday night study. Um, if you are watching online, we're doing things a little different tonight. We're trying this, so if, if it doesn't work, I didn't. it wasn't my idea. If it does work, I thought of it. But we're going to have a little interaction tonight in the room. So for those online, you may not be able to hear some of the comments. I'll try to repeat them. Um, and then we'll make sure everybody's inclusive on, on what's going on there. And we may, as we go along, adapt a little bit, have a, a mic we can pass around and let people make comments that way too. So that way it will be on the stream. But that's yet to be determined. We're going to just see how this goes. And, and if it goes well, hallelujah. If it doesn't, well, hallelujah. But at any rate, welcome. Uh, we are going to continue our study in Isaiah. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll open Isaiah chapter 30. Hey, we broke into 30. We finally got out of 29, didn't we? So, Father, we ask this evening that you would just uh, speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would have us engage in your word. I think it's important that we do have interaction and that we do have, do have this time that we can actually discuss your word. And so we pray that you would just uh, touch the hearts of those here and those online, Lord. And we just pray that you would minister to us through your word and through the power of your spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in our last study in chapter 29, we saw that Israel, in their pride, had come to the place where they thought they could act or do as they pleased and God wouldn't see it. Remember we talked about how they, they were thinking, hey, well, we can do this. Who's going to see it? Who's going to know? Well, we talked about, you know, you can't hide from God. No matter what the action, no matter what the activity, no matter who you are, where you are, God knows all. God sees all, and we see that in their reality, they had lost touch with who God is. They had lost touch with the relationship they were supposed to have with God, and so they were void of understanding. They had it backwards. It was the pot talking back to the potter, telling him how they want things to be. And we saw the parallel with the church today. It's, a lot of times it's, it, it's very easy for us to say, hey, God, this is what I want to do. Now bless it. And we see that very easily can happen in our own hearts and our own minds because we do have desires. We want to serve. We want to do things for the Lord. But if God has not placed that desire within us and he's not the one that exercises it in us to become reality, then sometimes we are really expecting him to bless something that he really doesn't have anything to do with. And this is really insanity when you think about it. It's insanity because... We, we basically are living in an ins insane, upside-down world. Sometimes the church has been sucked into the culture's ways, and because of that, it's very ineffective against it. So this week, we're going to continue the theme of rebellion and disobedience. So let's begin in Isaiah chapter 30. We'll begin with verses 1 and 2. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take count, but not of me. And who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they add, they may add sin to sin. Who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. So, first question for you all tonight. Who are these verses, verses 1 and 2, speaking to? Who is Isaiah writing to here? Israel, well, in this case, Judah, because what we have to remember is Israel and Judah have been separated. The northern tribes of Israel were coming under an attack from the Assyrians, and they were going to come after Judah next. So they were writing here specifically to Judah, and once they conquered them, they were coming against them. So knowing that, what is Judah, Judah's first mistake? What, what do we see that their first mistake was as we read these passages? They went for help other places, okay? Right. They, they were seeking help from other places, and that is one of the sins. But the first sin, and these, this is interesting because if you look at it, it's broken out. It's broken into two different sins because we look up here in verse 2, and it says they add sin to sin. So the first, the first mistake is they just didn't seek God. They just disregarded him. So they weren't seeking his counsel. So that was their first mistake. The second mistake was exactly what you all pointed out, 
and that is that they didn't trust God enough uh, in any aspect that they went and added sin on top of that. They put their trust in something else. It's one thing to reject God's counsel. It's another thing to seek after foreign counsel after you've rejected God's counsel. Does that make sense? So they didn't trust the Lord, and they put their trust in something else. So how does this relate to us today? Can we, can we kind of fast forward that into our place where we are today? How do we see that happening today in the world around us? Right, right, yeah. And that comment for those online, if you couldn't hear it, was is that we often go to our friends and family for their counsel that they may have expert advice in, but if we haven't gone to God first, their advice may not be at all what we need. It very well could be, but we need to seek God first. We need to actually go to him first and encourage, and I encourage all of us that that's what we do. And it's very easy sometimes to even fall back into the, the, the old, old culture of man, which is, okay, i got to fix this. i got to fix this. Now, we have a lot of talented people. I mean, in this room, there's a lot of talented people. There's a lot of people listening online. They're talented. They've got ways to solve problems. They're problem solvers. The hardest thing, I think, for a Christian is to put down that banner of problem solving. Is it not? And let God be the problem solver. How many times, and I'll let you inter interject on this, this question is not in the notes, but how many times have we seen God move in a way that we didn't expect because we trusted him rather than going back to the old playbook? Anybody know what I'm talking about there? Right. And again, for those online, there was there was an individual in our church that was with us for a while and and he was really going through a difficult time. And, and uh, can I use your name? All right. Norman. Uh, he's the one that runs all the digital stuff, by the way. So if there's any glitches, it's not his fault either. Um, that's Ned. That's Ned's fault next to him who runs the sound. But um, but anyway, he Norman is he, he loved he loved this individual dearly. And, and we all did. And, but this individual had a lot of struggles, and just it's physical, it was fi financial, it was all kinds of different things, relationship. And Norman, being the heart that he has, just wanted to pick up the banner and help him, and he did. I mean, Norman did so much for this individual, the church did as well. But what Norman said was, is when he found himself in a place to where he was stressing because he couldn't fix the problems for this individual. But when he released it to God, the very day that he released it, the apartment was found. Finances started to fall into place. Health situations started to go into place. And this individual, it was a blessing to us while he was here. He's now in uh, Indianapolis. But God used many people in his life, but, went, but we all had to come to that same place. We can't fix these problems. It's not in our, even if we had the money to fix the problems, that's not necessarily what needs to fix the problem. And so these are the type of things that we're talking about here. Uh, so what does it mean to trust in him? Anybody have any input on that? What does it mean to trust in God? Any thoughts? <laughs> okay. So Ned in the back said just to lean on, lean on God, not on yourself, and that's exactly what we're talking about. And it's a process. It does it, it's not an easy place to come in a relationship with the Lord. Again, you know, a lot of our prayers are not, God, you take it. Or maybe they are, but then to say, okay, now that you've had it long enough, let me have it back. But when we ask God to take it, we just let him have it and then let him do the work. Proverbs 3, verse, yeah, okay, go ahead.
That's true. Sometimes somebody that offers counsel or wants to help may not be hearing from the Lord. And so, you know, again, it's not that they're bad people, but they may also have ideas that, uh, that, that they've done before or have these things have happened in their life. And again, this is a, this is a situation, I've mentioned this many times here at the church, and that is, is that we have to be careful not to put God in a box. And because God has done a certain thing in somebody's life doesn't mean that he's going to do the exact same thing the exact same way in somebody else's life. We have to let God move in the freedom and by the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work. So as believers, we can't box God in in somebody else's life either by saying, hey, if you're not, if, if this is not helping, this is what you need to do. This is what God did in my life. This is how he did it. And if you're not doing it this way, so we have to be careful that we're not doing that. But Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So trusting, for us, it means to give it to him, and then get out of his way. Just give it to him and get out of his way. Yeah, so the comment there was is that sometimes things will approach you or they look good to you. You may see them a distance, whether you go to them or they come to you. It may be somebody with all the answers in other situations. They got the money, they got the power, they got whatever, and you're either drawn to them or they're drawn to you in order that they may manipulate. Sometimes, and I think that's pretty much what you're talking about sometimes too, and Johnny, is that they will come in and they will manipulate because they see you have a problem. And we're going to touch on that again in a minute, but that's a very good point. What's that? YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're getting your gospel from YouTube, unless you're following us, of course, you know. Now, <laughs> now we're not discouraging people from following us online. Don't get us wrong. But, um, but if you're going anywhere else, no, I'm just kidding. But there are some danger zones out there. You can find, you can find some way out teaching on the Internet. You know, and what do they always say? Well, if it's on the Internet, it has to be true. Well, I'm sorry, but that's, that's a lie. That's just not true. So trusting means to give it to him, get out of his way, and let him work it out according to his plan. And the next step is not trying to get help from the other source, and we've covered some of that. Johnny just mentioned that as well. But what, some, what are some sources that we talk about? We just mentioned YouTube. We just talked maybe about the Internet in general. That's a place people will, are drawn to. I mean, how many people have been on uh, the web, the doctor, web doctor, or whatever it is? I mean, we've all web, what, web MD is that what it is? Yeah, I mean, we've all we we've, we've been we self-diagnose, don't we? I mean, if I go on there, I've got everything they have. <laughs> I've, I've got one symptom of that, so I've got to have it, and I've got one symptom. So next thing you know, you know, you go to the doctor, doctor, I'm dying, and the doctor says, "Well, you're you're a little nuts, but you're not dead yet." But another place is maybe uh, self-help books. Yeah, motivational books. Going and finding these places and things that have been written that are not biblically grounded. And that, again, is a danger zone. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that, that call themselves pastors, but they're more motivational speakers than they are actual pastors because they're really not speaking a lot of God's word. They're just telling you how you can be a better person. And they bring in God's word sometimes. But sometimes they don't. But these type of resources are there. Mm. Okay. And that comment was about uh, comment about commentaries that sometimes we focus more on man's writing about something than God's word itself. And we need to go to the source first in our studies. We need to be in the word of God. And those, the, the, what you will find is when you're doing that, and, and this, is, this is 
what helps me in my study time when I'm actually putting studies together. I honestly believe the Holy Spirit gives me the direction as I go through the text. And once he's given me the direction, then we kind of go through it, and he, he just places scriptures in my head. I don't have a, an excellent memory. I thank God for uh, Bible Gateway and Blue Letter Bible, all of these sources that you can go to, because sometimes I've got the verse, but I'm thinking of it in the New King James Version, because that may be how I memorized it, or maybe the, uh, the Old King James Version, or maybe the New International. So you have to type in a couple of phrase words, and then it pops up all the verses, and you can scroll, and you can find the very one that, that the Holy Spirit spoke. And so I go to there first, and that's typically 90% of the time, no, 99% of the time when I'm doing a study, that's how I put it together. And then I'll go to commentaries. And what's amazing is when I do that, I see the, co I can find which commentators at some point you don't go to, you know, because they're completely not in alignment with the word or their way out there. But, but you have plenty that you can go to and draw from. And then you can even quote because sometimes I'll be going through and say, man, they said that better than I could say it. So I'll, I'll put that in. But that's not my main source. My main source is going to be the word of God. And then another way that we have to be careful of is seeking worldly wisdom in general. Seeking worldly wisdom because it's out there. And, and we can find a way to solve any problem out there if we seek hard enough. 2 Corinthians 1.12 says, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. And this was the Apostle Paul writing. And so what he's saying is, is that we didn't come in here and present ourselves as though as know-it-alls in the world's way of doing things. We came in simplicity of godly sincerity. And he also has said sincere in simplicity of the, of the gospel, the word of God, the simplicity of Jesus Christ. So here in our text, we see Judah seeking help from Egypt as though Pharaoh can be better help for them than their own God. In verses 3 through 5, Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them, or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. So in, that, in these passages, what does, what does it mean when he says the shadow of Egypt? And we read that. And trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. What does it mean by that, the shadow of Egypt? Any thoughts? Right. Mm hmm. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay, so the first comment was is that Egypt was already on the decline. It wouldn't be long before they were overtaken by Babylon. And the second is is that there's nothing but a shadow outside of God, pretty much. Is I think to summarize what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, um, you're looking at God. You're looking at the awesome creator. You're looking at he breathed life into man to begin with. He knows all things. He controls all things. Nothing happens that doesn't sift through his hand. And Israel has that history. They knew who God was. They had all the history of of the exodus from Egypt. And here they are calling back on Egypt of whom they know they were exiled. I mean, they, they, they moved out of all those years earlier. But again, people, we have short memories, don't we? We have short memories. But um, so they were going there as a shadow. They, they were basically just shadow boxing, if you will. You know, and there is nothing uh, that a shadow boxer can do. You know, he can swing all he wants, but he's not going to hit anything. You know, now if you and if you were making that shadow and you hit yourself it still wasn't the shadow that hit you it's you know you just you just made a dumb punch but they have no substance and when you compare any nation today put our nation 
Russia, China, any nation you want to, as big and as powerful as they are, they're nothing but a shadow in comparison to God. He brings up nations, and he brings them down. And God is in control of all things. Right. Mm hmm Yep. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So in our culture, we're guilty of taking God out of the culture, but then blaming him when, when, when something goes bad. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So if God is not the top, it will topple at some point. And historically, we're in that window of time based on where other nations have fallen in that same uh, around the same time frame, 200 to 300 years. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that point was is that many times you want to trust, but you don't know how to trust, or maybe you've forgotten your own history, and in this case they had, because they had all the history behind them. All they had to do was go back and read what God had done for them when they were what? Obedient. And that's what he told them all along. If you go back and read in Deuteronomy, he said, look, here's, here's, I'm just laying it out for you. If you do this and you walk in obedience, these are the blessings. If you walk in disobedience, these are the curses. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. And so God put it out for him all the way in the beginning and over and over and over as you go through this particular book here uh, in Isaiah. It is just amazing how we see over and over and over again how they'll, they, they just, it's just like this. And you go back to the book of Judges. We're doing the Bible study on Monday nights in the book of Judges. And it's the same thing. You know, the judge steps in because God has mercy on the people after their disobedience. Then he drives out the ones that are uh, bringing persecution to them. And they go that way for a few years. Next thing you know, and again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And again, he delivers them. And again. They do evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's a pattern. It's human nature. But isn't that what we're supposed to be dying to? We're supposed to be dying to that nature. And that's, that's a battle that we're going to face one level or another in our lives until we see Jesus face to face. So, moving on. Psalm uh, 47.8 says, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. And Psalm 102.15 says, so the nation shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. Now those two verses alone show us that God is in control. And it's, there are many, many, many more I could quote. I couldn't put them all in here tonight. But God is on his throne. He's never been dethroned. He will never be dethroned. No matter what we see happening around us, God is in control. So, any and all nations are under his hand of authority. So, again, why would you go to the weak for the help instead of the strong? So, let's look at verse 5. Does anybody have a comment on verse 5? And I'll reread it. They were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. Any comment on that? Now, this is Egypt looking upon Judah. Da, 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 da. Okay, so the comment was that even in this country, there are elected officials, a lot of them, that look down upon those who voted upon them. 
or specific if you didn't vote for them. But, but you know, they, they do. They look at us with disdain. They don't look at us. They, they, they feel that they're in the elite place, and they know all and know what's best for us. Even if the rules don't apply to them, they still want to apply the rules to us. That's, that's pretty much, in a nutshell, what we're seeing here. Israel, I mean, Judah was looking at, at uh, Egypt, but Egypt was looking at them with shame and disgust. So wh- how are you going to help us? I mean, we're gonna, you come into us, and we're going to help you, but we don't even like you. Why would we want to do this? But, you know, it was kind of a nonchalant attitude, really, that Egypt had here regarding what they were going to do. But according to this verse, it says they were all ashamed of Judah who could not benefit them or be a help or a benefit, but they would be a shame and also a reproach. And that's how Egypt looked at Judah. So we see that, but Judah still wanted their help. Judah still wanted their help. And that's just the mindset that Judah had at that point. We're not going for God's help. We'll go after a country who is big enough to help us, even though they despise us. And so they did. That was the direction that they went. So moving to verse 6 and 7. The burden against the beast of the south, through a land of trouble and anguish, from which came the lioness and the lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent, they will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I've called her Rahab him Shabeth. So, reading those verses, do we have any thoughts on what Isaiah is meaning when he speaks against the beasts of the south? Okay, so let's put this into, into perspective. The beast of the south are the beast in Judah because the northern tribes have already been conquered, so now they're coming after the southern tribes. So the beast of the south are the animals, the pack animals. Basically, they're the pack animals, the camels, uh, the mules, the donkeys. They're the ones that, that is going to carry all of this bribe money to Egypt, Okay. So in that perspective, what they're saying is, is we're going to carry all this stuff, but they're going to get little in return. And so even Isaiah, as he's writing this, he has this burden against the animals. And it's not that he's despising the animals. I think he feels sorry for them. He's like, even the animals are being led to do something that's not going to benefit you guys. There'll be no benefit. You'll put your treasure, your gold and your silver and all this stuff on the animals' backs, and send it to Egypt, and you'll get nothing in return. (coughs) Excuse me. Now, does anybody know what Rahab him Shabeth means? I know somebody's going to answer this because we've probably got footnotes. What's that? Rahab sits idle. Exactly. Now, what's that? Well, it could be to come to an end. Yeah, basically means it, that when you put all this stuff out there, there will be nothing in return. It will come to an end for you, and they will be taken captive, by the way. So it can mean that. But the main, um, but the main uh, interpretation is re- Rahab sits idle. Now, Rahab is not speaking of Rahab the harlot. Okay, David Guzik says this. Rahab is a name, but it is also the Hebrew word for pride and is sometimes used as a title for Egypt. Egypt will sit idly by as the Assyrians trouble Judah, even though they've packed all their treasure down there to pay them off. It, they, they'll do nothing for them. They, they would do nothing for them. So, so Rahab sits idle. Egypt sits idly by while the Assyrians move in, even though you've paid them to help you. So there's one other thing we can glean from that, and that is you can't trust the sources outside of God. Even though, when, I, and I, and when I say put your trust in earlier, I'm meaning you can't, you can't go to them and seek help, but once you've done that, you can't depend that what you've done is going to work out the way you thought it was going to work out because they will turn on you 
as quick as they've got your stuff. You know, just look at the tax bill every year. How many times have you paid taxes that were supposed to be focusedly appointed, appropriated to certain places? But it doesn't go there, does it? <laughs> it goes wherever else they want it to go. So when you look at that, you can see the same, the same thing. When man has his way, he doesn't have to honor his word. And Egypt didn't honor their word. And God knew it, but God allowed Judah to go that way because that was their will. That was their will against God's will. That's the God that we serve. He does not override our will. He wants us to surrender it, but he won't override it. And each one in our lives have seen those same situations where, God, I wish you'd intervene. I wish you'd have just shut my will down. And God said, but I love you enough for you to make the choice so that you see the consequences and see that your wisdom doesn't measure up to my wisdom. And that's a lot of times how we grow is through dumb mistakes following our will instead of following God's will. All right, so what's it? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. So the comment there was is that uh, through these animals, including the flying uh, what, flying serpent, is that what the word was? Yeah, right. So you got the lion, you've got the right. Mhm. Mm yeah. Mhm. Mm so basically, this comment is is that their treasure traveled through the area that was controlled by Satan, and Satan was in all of that, and they were going to lose it all by going through there and giving it over to those things that represented evil instead of, again, for giving it to God and letting God handle the whole situation. Good. Yeah. They've, yeah, exactly. They've abandoned the true treasure of God. The relationship with God is always the best thing. That's really what we seek. You know, when if we, a lot of times we get kind of mixed up, well, you know, we want to be, have the blessings of God, but what are the blessings of God? Well, you can put in the fruit of the Spirit or the blessings of God. You can put, put in the, the whole aspect of what God does in your life and how he ministers and, and, and raises you up. But the real treasure is the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. He is what we're seeking. He is the treasure. And that's, uh, that's what, when we look at this, we have to understand that that, that is really what, I what Judah in this particular case had lost. They had already lost that treasure because they weren't walking in relationship with God. But then now it's going to be, they're going to give all their other monetary treasure over, and it's, it's going to be gone too. And pretty soon the Assyrians would be, be moving in on them. So what do we glean from this study? Any one or two thoughts? I've got three thoughts here, but I'll let you guys go first. Anything particular that stands out at you in this study? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so all of the ground is, is a sinking sand foundation. If you put your trust in your treasure and you take it off of God, you've already you've already lost it all. You pretty much have lost in that point. Um, and that's exactly right. But the, the first point that I wrote down was trust in God, not ourselves, or any other means. That's the overall theme uh, of, of way to put it. Another aspect to this, and if anybody has any comments on this, God will not share his glory. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So he should have no other gods before him. He's a jealous God. Right. So in any ministry or gifting that God gives you to do, we have to give him the glory for that as well. Otherwise, again, you know, we're taking glory. And once we start doing that, you know, it starts falling apart. It starts falling apart. A third point that I wrote down is he will frustrate any and all plans that are not from him. Even if they look good in theory or look good on paper. You know, I mean, anybody got any, any any examples of that? Maybe anything you can share on how you've seen things that plans that look really good, but God wasn't in it. And he frustrated it. Nothing lined up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hillary lost. OK, that's far as we're going to go on that one. But yeah. Yeah, he frustrated that plan, didn't he? Ah, good point. The heartbeat bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the heartbeat bill that was passed uh, to pretty much put a halt to most all abortion in the state has been stalled out in the courts. Um, and, and the thing is, is it, it, it's a good theory, it's a good plan, it was a good writing, but they didn't go far enough. And so now it's coming back to bite them on it. And so you have that. Mm hmm Yeah. Right. They, that's right, they took the core of it out, you know. And this is the whole point, that you can come up with a good idea and come up with a good plan, but if you don't listen to him and follow through with it, it will fr it will be frustrated. Things don't work out the way that we want them to work out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. God's plans that He wants to put in place um, it delays, if nothing else, it delays them because we're still trying to do things in our own way. So, but He does. He frustrates those. In Job five twelve, we read He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. And in Isaiah 44, 24 through 26, we read, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backwards and makes their knowledge foolishness. Now that is the God that we serve. And what we need to be consciously reminded of day by day, moment by moment, is that God is this all-powerful God. He did put everything into place. He formed us in the womb. He makes all things. He stretched out heaven. It was him alone, all by himself. He frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives, and drives out diviners. And we've got a lot of babblers right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and a lot of people are frustrated, that even in the political realm, there's a lot of people frustrated because they can't get their agenda done the way they want it done. And that's on either side of the aisle. But the truth is, is that unless all that is laid aside in, in, in any government, they're going to always be frustrated. But it brings it right back, though, to here. Because first, it has to be addressed in the church. And we're the church. So if we find ourselves coming up with plans... We find ourselves trying to come up with a way that, that uh, passing a law or thinking this ought, this ought to be a law or this ought to this and this ought to that. If we come up with all of these ideas, that's all fine and good. But if we're not seeking God, if we're not putting him first, if we're not dying to ourselves, if we're not continually 
putting him in that place to where we trust him and him alone, then we ourselves are going to find our, be, be frustrated. And we may not be the babblers and the diviners. I don't think that any Christian are. Well, I've seen some babbling Christians, but very few. Um, but but I, I, re- I love this part of the verse when he says he turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness. We've got some worldly wise people all around us. But there's no wisdom compar- in compared to God. They can't do anything that's wise. And they're being frustrated and their knowledge is foolishness. So. With all of that in place, I think I think that uh, I think that we can glean a lot, and and again, making sure that we really put ourselves in that place of saying, God, I do not understand everything, so therefore I cannot make a plan that's going to be the right plan. You have to give me that plan. You have to show it to me. Our 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 uh, finite minds cannot comprehend outside of what we can see and hear and touch, feel, taste, all that stuff. God's way outside of all that. He knows the next step before we take it and that's always good to know you know even though he doesn't always tell us but he knows he knows the next step he knows where we're going and many times we find out i find ourselves right outside of that <laughs> and we realize we're out and we boop, get right back in there let me get back on that path i want to be there i don't want to be over here it's dark over here and there's a lot of you know you, you feel like you're going through the old fairy tale woods you know there's always something going to grab you well, Satan's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And if we're not in God's plan, we're very vulnerable. So that's our study tonight. Thank you for your input, everyone. Thank you for those online that were listening. And I would ask for input for those who are listening online. If you'll let Norman know, you know, how you perceive the way it went out and whether we all the questions and all the comments were covered in a, in a good way, because I, I believe this is a format I want to try again, and so on our Wednesdays, and then we'll kind of go from there. So, Father, we ask that you will just put this word upon our hearts and let us continue to put ourselves in a place to where we are seeking you first. We are thinking in that direction and not trying to come up with all the plans on our own, because, God, we can't, we can't solve anything in our own lives. You're the breath that we breathe. Lord, you are everything to us. And let us always keep that in our hearts and minds. And we love you and we praise you and we thank you and thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together in Jesus' name.